welcome everyone, it's Nicola Cairncross here and you're listening to and watching A Better Entrepreneur podcast. Today I've got a fantastic interview with someone who I've known for many years, Yvonne Halling from bedandbreakfastcoach.com. Yvonne ran her own successful bed and breakfast in the Champagne region of France for many years and she surprised me several times on this interview as well as nearly bringing me to tears a couple of times too. If you're an entrepreneur or you're someone who's running their own business or even a freelancer you are absolutely going to love this interview. We go through everything. We go through marketing, we go through entrepreneurial spirit, we go through a few book recommendations that have made a major difference to us and we talk about what's worked and what hasn't in both our businesses and we both talk about the highs as well as the lows and Yvonne's had plenty of both. It was a great great interview and I really hope you're going to enjoy it. Please if you do show your appreciation by commenting wherever you're watching the interview and uh, I really just hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's get on with it shall we? Hello how are Hello. you? Welcome Yvonne I'm so delighted that you're here on my podcast A Better Entrepreneur which I'm gearing up to talk to all sorts of amazing business people. Tell me a bit about you. I obviously know you really well, but tell me a bit about you for the, the listeners and the viewers and, and then we'll get started on some of the uh, momentous events along the way. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be here, Nicola. Thank you for inviting <laughs> me. It's always great to chat with you. Who am I? Well, in this current incarnation, I am uh, Yvonne Halling Bed and Breakfast Coach, where I run a company, an online business, where I help independent hospitality businesses to make more money, have more fun and work less. And I've been doing that for uh, 10 years now, officially 10 years and a little bit wow. officially before that. Yes. So that's that's where I'm at at the moment um, in, in my journey. So it's always <laughs> struck me as, you know, as someone who owned a bed and breakfast and as you know, and and really jumped into it without knowing it much I'd run a couple of hotels before as a manager and assistant manager but having your own business is a whole different thing isn't it and oh. I've always so many people around the world think I'd love to run a bed and breakfast oh yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely so I think tell us how you tell us how your your journey started with this because I, I you know who we who was Yvonne Halling before she became a business person and and how did you become a bed and breakfast owner and then how did you become the bed and breakfast coach well, it's a long journey, so I, I don't know how long you've got. But, well, um, but as long as you as long as you I, need, I'm aiming for a Joe Rogan esque style on these interviews. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So I, I guess I, I made a few notes thinking back. You know, when did my entrepreneurial journey start? And it was a long time ago. So um, I think that I, I was always quite sort of I had a really good work ethic as a child and I always wanted to make money, always looking to earn money. Yeah, I did so too. Where does it's that funny come that? from? I don't know because my my girls aren't like that. Yeah, it's, I think it's, I, I do believe there is an entrepreneurial gene. I really do. Well, I think my mother had it, actually. Yeah. I think my mother had it. She wasn't able to fully um, explore that in her lifetime. But my grandfather was an entrepreneur. And he, he, on my mother's side, his, her father was an entrepreneur, but it, he didn't know that until he worked down the coal mines oh. and he had an accident. There was an accident in the coal mines and, you know, how the roof falls in and stuff like oh, that. Horrendous, in those yeah. days. Yes. And he, apparently the story is that he put his leg out to protect his young son, who was also working down the coal mines. He had four sons. Um, sorry, five sons, and they all worked down the coal mines. And he put his leg out to save his son, and it broke his leg. And you know, we're talking a long, you know, long time ago in the 1920s, I would think, mm. or maybe my, my 1930s. And he got he got a 50 pound compensation check from the coal mining company. And with that 50 pound check, he started a coach service, like a bus service. And he what, with his he, broken leg or well, his leg <laughs> mended, but he couldn't go down the coal mines ever again. Oh, right. So with this That's 50 probably a lucky quid, break. Absolutely. 50 quid compensation. <laughs> yeah. He he started a bus company, like a coach company. Wow. And um he, he made it uh, quite successful, quite quite successful. Good and I him. think yes, um, in, in his day. And he, you know, they they were doing um school, school pickups and stuff like that. And then he went into holidays. And then I, I don't think he went into international holidays, but he's definitely doing holidays in the UK. 
they my, wow. my mother my mother was from scotland and her family were all scottish and so she I, I remember, you know, she was always looking f- to do something on the side. She always had a side hustle, my mother. Mm. And then she, in, in the 60s, when I was young, she became an Avon lady. And she became quite good at it. And she won the sort of Avon lady of the area where we were living at the time. And um, and this this was quite a big thing. And then she sort of, and then she did little odd jobs on the side. and then And then she ended up, my father and my mother ended up buying a shop a corner shop and this is after I'd left home but I think that's where it came from so going back to my childhood I was always looking for a side hustle so I did a paper round as everyone does you know getting up at six in the morning in the cold and dark (laughs) absolutely hated that and then I went into being a hairdresser and I did the Saturday job at the hairdressers and got paid two and six Mm-hmm. Um, half a crown and then oh, blimey uh, so that was between but that was before money I remember when money changed I got two and six pocket money yeah. and then suddenly it was 12 and a half p and it just didn't seem the same and didn't certainly didn't I I realized it didn't buy as much and looking back now as a someone who's been become interested in macroeconomics it it actually did devalue yes. in in purchasing power it yeah. always does, though. That's another story. Yeah. But money always devalues. Yeah. So after that, um, after I worked in the hairdressing, I was probably about 13 at the time. And then I th- I sort of fancied myself as a bit of a singer. I was in the choir at school. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm in a choir now, um, actually. It's also, very... it's supposed to be wonderful for your mental health. Oh, I, I can't tell you how. It's like therapy, honestly. It's so fantastic, singing. Yeah. So then a few friends of mine at school, we got together and formed a bit of a girl band, you know, and oh, and, wow. that, and that didn't go anywhere, really. You know, it's all all a bit of fun. And then and then I, I learned to sew. So, um, again, my mother taught me how to sew and we she used to make clothes and then I started making my own clothes. And then I st- and then my friend said, oh, I like your dress. And I'd say, well, I made that. And they'd say, oh, can you make me one? So I started. I can't believe how similar our stories are in really? that way. I, really? I was making clothes from the age of 12 for other people. Oh, because yeah, my, nan, we... my nan had taught me how to sew. And yeah. it was an amazing skill. I think everybody knew how to sew in, in those days. Yeah. But, and then but then that was before we got the imports from China. Yes. Right? And, and clothing became really cheap to buy. Yeah, Marks and Spencer's killed my fashion career, really. Yes. <laughs> then I and so I I was making dresses for my friends and then I worked in Woolworths you know on yeah, a Saturday yeah. I, job. I did uh, uh Timothy White's which was right the, yes yeah. I remember Timothy White's yeah um and then I got a job in a corner shop as well on Saturdays and, and that's a bit of a story actually in the corner shop um it, it was up the road from where we lived at the time and um it was run by a German guy and his partner um who was a little bit off the off the uh, off her head most of the time. Okay, um, quite drunk most of the time, and, and he he was quite drunk. And then he had a a fancy woman on the side who had a son, and it was all very dramatic. You know? And every time I went to work on a Saturday, you just didn't know what you were going to find. And he he'd shove twenty quid in my hand, you know, just to keep quiet. And it was all very hush hush and funny. And then, uh, and then, of course, you know, you leave school and then I, I did a, a course in shorthand and typing and I kind of forgot about making money for myself at that point because, you know, you're too busy working really and trying to trying to keep hold, hold down a job and, and being a teenager, a late teenager as well. And then I remember, and then it started to bubble up again when I was working in corporate. So I was... I worked for a duty-free drinks company for 15 years, aged 20 to 35. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, we had, we're having trouble with the cleaners. We couldn't get any decent cleaners to clean the office. And I remember thinking to myself, I could do that. Me and my friend Julie could do that. You know, we could set up a cleaning business, right? Yeah. And then <laughs> all these sort of fanciful ideas. But that didn't go anywhere either. And then I had my children, started traveling the world, had my children in Japan. And tell us why you were traveling the world. Well, again, with the duty free drinks company, I met my current husband at that place of work. 
And during the time that I was at the, in the duty free drinks company in Southampton, where I was living, it was a domestic uh, company. We used to supply booze to the ferries and the cruise ships. Okay. And then it, the company was bought by uh, another company and then it became international. And so there were lots of opportunities there internationally. This is in the sort of late eighties. And so my, my, current husband was offered a job in san francisco and he just said to me do you want to come so i went and that was not, yeah yeah absolutely i just thought yeah do that so off we trot in 1989 to san francisco and we lived there for a year it was absolutely amazing and i was just i was still working for the duty free drinks company um sort of part-time in 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 the office in san francisco and then um and then he got a, he then got a job in Tokyo because there were all these international opportunities. So he got a job in Tokyo. So off we trot to Tokyo, and I'm pregnant. Well, wow, that's this a time. big move, isn't it, with small children? Well, I, they I didn't I was pregnant then with my our okay. first our first daughter with Chloe, and um, so we arrived in Tokyo in August 1990, and I was about four months pregnant, and um, and that's when I kind of um, I I sort of fell on my feet in Tokyo because very quickly I met the expat community. Okay. Which, which was amazing. Absolutely amazing. At that time when we were in Tokyo in the early nineties, there were like 50,000 expats living there and about 30,000 of them were Americans. Wow. So that we had a very big social, uh, a very big social <laughs> life there. And what we used to do, and, and there were all sorts of like Japanese craft workshops and, and courses you could take and, and things you could do, you know, there, were, there was so much going on. And the entrepreneurial thing was really born, well, rekindled then, because what we were doing in Tokyo, we were all into something and we yeah. were hold, holding like house sales where there'd be there'd be Joanne selling her jewellery that she'd made and there'd be um, Mary from Australia selling her soaps that she'd made and there'd be my friend Janice and I, we were making, we were covering these Japanese tea boxes with secondhand kimonos. Oh, I mean, it, wow. okay. it was, it was because we'd learned to do that in yeah. Japan, you know, from somebody else. And so we, everybody was selling things to each other. And of course we all had loads of money because we were living that sort of expat life, you know, it's amazing. We had maids, we had the cleaners, you know, it was just, it, it was. Is that because the salaries were so high in proportion to the cost of living in these countries? Well, it was because the salaries were so high and also everything was paid for, you know, yeah. we, oh, had, okay. we didn't have to pay for our housing, you know, we just had to feed ourselves, of course, and, and clothe ourselves, but everything else was paid by the company because we were on an expat assignment and right. there were you know there were people there from the banks of course and there were people there uh, my friend Janice her husband was with Ke uh, Kellogg's and then my other friend um Joan her husband he was with who was the oh yeah Unilever I think it was Unilever so all of the big conglomerates were in Tokyo at this time mm. and we were with the international drinks company so um and that lasted four years we had both of our both of our children were born in tokyo but then i was really i got really good i remembered that i could sew and so we got really good at making these really artistic japanese tea boxes i don't know how to explain them to you but when you think of a tea box you think of those sort of wooden things with metal around the rim right that, that you get from india yeah. but they weren't like that they were like wooden boxes and they had lids that you could lift off and we would pad them all and we would, you know, put um, sort of embellishments on them with ribbons and cords and stuff like that. They were, they were truly lovely. And I've still got a couple today. So then we went back to the UK and then I started sewing proper. So I enrolled myself on a soft furnishings course and I learned how to make curtains because I, I had been making my own curtains up mm. to that point anyway because I like sewing and um, I, I passed my soft furnishings diploma city and guilds diploma in soft furnishings and interior design in that brief time that we were in the UK and then and then my husband got a job with Moe in France so we went to France 
And then I was still doing curtains. I was still making curtains for French people, you know, in the Champagne region. If you were to go to the Champagne region today, you'd probably find evidence of my handiwork <laughs> in one or two houses. It, it's bizarre, isn't it? Oh, that's amazing. And then, I know. And so I was always making money on the side, always had a side hustle. I, I think all of most it of it keeps my you sane, was, I think, as well, when the children are little. <laughs> well, it does. And and I, I do like making things. You know, I, I like sewing and we, we would make our own Christmas cards. And then because we'd lived in Japan, we knew about origami. So we'd we'd spend ages, me and the girls, you know, making these little cranes and we've got oh, Christmas lovely. decorations yeah. that we'd made. You know, if they only there'd be next year around in those days. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So then, okay, so it, it's all it's all going swimmingly, right? P pretty much. And then in 2005, uh, my husband they had a big restructuring at Moe in Epane where he was working. And um, he was laid out off with a whole swathe of middle management. They completely changed the way they were working. Yeah. And they didn't need this, this these people in the middle anymore so we but by that time I'd already opened a B&B &B. yeah got oh. that. let's go back to 2000 we bought a house in France so that I could run a B&B because &B. I I met somebody right who was running a B&B &B when I was living in in Epene so I, I just skipped past the bit where I opened a B&B &B, right so after we'd been in in France for a little while I met somebody, I mean, I was a bit bored, to be honest, because my husband was traveling a lot with his really glamorous job at Moe. You can imagine what that was like. And mm. I was stuck at home in rural France with our two little girls. And then I met a girl, a lady who was doing B&B. &B, and I, this had never crossed my mind before to do this, right? Mm. And I looked at her and I looked at what she was doing and I was thinking, well, I can do that, right? How hard can that be? Yeah. Um, um, See, this is you're just like you're so like me. It's it's <laughs> astonishing because I always do. You know, I, I I have ideas, or I see what other people are doing, or I I have an itch that I need to scratch myself, and I always think, yeah, how hard can that be? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I skipped the part where I I I did a course in um in London to be a cordon bleu cook as well. I did that as well. Wow. So, you know, the B&B &B was perfect for me, right? Because yeah. I, I could make things, I could make a lovely home and I could, you know, make curtains and cushions and I could cook. I've always liked cooking. And so I saw this lady doing B&B &B and I thought, wow, I can do that, right? How hard can it be? So I persuaded my husband to buy us a house. So we bought this big house in a village in the vineyards and we renovated it. It was a big renovation job and I had two rooms. And I just did it as a hobby because I was just a bit bored while he was away. And of course, it was money on the side. Yeah. And we, we all loved it, really. The girls loved it. And, you know, they were meeting international people. This is before the Internet. Yeah. And can I just ask a quick question? I mean, how, how was the French bureaucracy or did you not trouble yourself with that? <laughs> OK, I excellent. I <laughs> <laughs> well, Always better to story. ask for, for forgiveness than ask for permission. I, I do that. Yeah, I do yeah. that. I learned that from the French. That's what they do. Oh, excellent. OK. Yes. Not a leg to stand on then. No. So uh, there's another story about that in a second. But um, it's, it's who you know, really. The job thing fell, out, fell apart in 2005 and we closed the B&B &B and we rented out the house and we went back to the UK. And my husband didn't. What was your job. thinking there? But he would a, be he would be better able able to get yes, a job in the UK. Wow. Yes. And also at that point, we've been 10 years in France. And at that point, this is before the Internet. Right. And all the communication channels that we have now. Yeah. Well, I it remember was, I'd start. I had. I Yeah, I started on the Internet in 95 and I bought my B&B &B in 2003 and Google AdWords had just started then. Right. So. Right. Yes. Well, it hadn't reached us in France. OK. <laughs> But we and, must have met around 2000, the early 2003, 2005, mustn't we? I, I think it about six, I think, 2006, okay. maybe. Okay. Yes. And so at that point, we'd been 10 years in France and our girls were growing up, you know, and I'd actually had enough of it, to be honest yeah. with you. And I wanted to go home at that point. And I, I also felt, we felt that he'd have more of a chance of getting a job 
in the UK than an Englishman in France, right? Because yeah. it's, it, and the Champagne world is very small. You know, they move around from Moet to Verve Clicquot to Pommery yeah. to Paul Roger. And it was going to be, and, and it was going through a bit of a slump at the time, which is why Moet had changed their, their, their operating um, system, if you like. Mm. And there was a lot of people looking for jobs in Champagne at that point. And, you know, he wasn't going to be top of the list because he was English. And so we did. We came back to the UK and that's when everything kind of opened up for me as an entrepreneur. And we he he tried to get a job in the UK, but there were other problems as well. But what we did in 2006, we started an online champagne company called the Champagne Discovery Company. Wow. And what we were doing, we were importing champagne from our friends back in France, small producers that we got to know because we'd been living there for 10 years. And, you know, families of our daughter's friends who were, they were all making champagne. There's so many producers, small producers. Wow. And we started importing them into the UK and we set up a website in 2006. Wow, that was so early for most people, wasn't it? My God, it was like a baptism of fire. It was incredible. And do you remember Total Business Cart? Of course I do. Yes. I, I'm still very friends with Paul Fugel, who right. which was a white a white label of one shopping cart, which That's I use. That's the one. That's the yeah. one. So you know, all of that back end admin system was like, oh my god, we well, need you had this. a mailing list. You were able yes. to sell products. You yes. were able to do follow up emails yes. to people who opted in or bought. Yes. it was way ahead of its time. Way oh, ahead of its time. totally way ahead of its time. Way ahead. But we got that. And, uh -huh. you know, we spent a fortune on all of this stuff. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. And that we we met Mark Atwood at that time as well. Do you remember Mark Atwood? I do. I I, I still follow his videos sometimes. Yes, I, didn't, I, I do. I didn't know where I knew him from. No. Well, well he, I, I saw his video and I thought, I know that guy and I can't think where from. Right. Yeah. Because it was all it was all going on at that time, wasn't it? Online. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was like a, everything was like it was like the gold rush. Yes, so it we, was. So we were persuaded, you know, to part with a lot of money and, and set up this online business. Right. And it was God. I mean, we didn't know what the heck we were doing. So and, were you were you the suddenly the uh, tech tech person behind the operations person, yes, online business person? Yes, I was suddenly. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and I remember my husband went over to uh, the, the US, you know, because there were some early kind of online marketing gurus emerging in the US at this time. Yeah, I can't Frank remember the Kern, guys. Ed yes. Dale, yes. Uh, Mark, Mike Phil Same, yes. all the people, all Paul, the people um, came Chris up. Farrell, you know, all of these yeah. people, Mike Phil Same, yes. Um, all the people who stood on the stage at the World Internet Summit in 2006 in Wembley, where I got my first chance to speak in public. Really? Was it really? Yeah. Alan, well, oh. Alan Forrest Smith was the contact and he just brought all, I mean, it was the World Internet Summit, we're traveling around the world. And finding people with influence in each country. And Alan Forrest Smith was the one here, sadly just wow. departed recently. Yes, he did. Yeah. 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 So this that, was a, I remember this, that. Oh God, it, it was like the gold rush, wasn't it? I mean, they they were selling you on this, you know, make money online while sipping margaritas on the beach thing, weren't they? That's what they well, were Well, it was selling. interesting because I I never because I had my hotel, I had my the money gym co company, the book and the coaching yes. program. And then I had the hotel, which I used to host money gym workshops in. So whenever I learned something new, like Google AdWords, I would always apply it to my real world businesses. Yes. And then, so I didn't really go for that whole, um, you know, it was make it? money or online passive, thing. In, passive income. Yes. <laughs> what a <laughs> laugh that was. But but it did benefit my real world businesses. And then I started attracting wow. people to the workshops about the internet in my hotel yeah. from the money gym, which is must be where we met. Yes, it was. I yes, yeah. that's where I met you and Judith at the money yes. gym. Yes, yes. Sadly, again, someone else it magnificently Absolutely. just left us. Yeah. Yes, yes, very sad. Yeah, so, Judith so, was amazing. Oh, yes, phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal. And she lady. embraced the internet thing completely, although she yeah. was so uh, spirit, not spiritual. She was, she well, she was what we'd call woo-woo, yeah. but she was into everything. Yeah. And she had a brain like a steel trap and she, yeah. she, she got the internet thing straight away. Yeah, it yeah. was, it was phenomenal. It was an amazing yeah. time, right? And, um, and of, of course, we didn't know what we were doing with this online business. I remember we made, um, we made, you know, you needed a lead mag magnet, right? Yes, we, oh, we, an ethical bribe, as they were yes, called. Yes, <laughs> right. And so we, 
my husband went to Champagne and he filmed a video oh, of, wow. of him going around small producers and showing people the area and the grapes that are grown, you know, because he knows a lot about Champagne, having worked at Moe. Does he know anything about video? Well, he didn't know, not at the time. <laughs> but we had a video production company make that video. And I remember, I remember us shipping it out, you know, physically physically and we had sacks of these things people were signing up left right and center for this dvd that oh we made God, that's amazing it, we've still got the dvd i wonder if it's here we've still got one copy i'll, I'll send it to you i'll send it yeah. i know we've not the got dvd it i wouldn't know what to do with it <laughs> no right but i'll give you a picture of it right it's called okay. discovering champagne and okay. we were all about discovering the small producers you know the the little people really so That's really what... this is this is naked wines in advance this oh naked yeah wines? we were way ahead of our time okay we were yeah. way ahead of our time and i think that's a theme with me actually and me uh, too always yeah. too early always. always too early yeah so um so that sort of limped along you know doing all right and then we were supplying some local restaurants because we we're living in south manchester and then and that business kind of morphed into a tasting and events business so we were doing um you know banks and financial institutions around south manchester so you can imagine what happened in 2008 can't you well Completely it was all kicking gone. off in manchester wasn't it or, or oh 2008 now that's when yeah. it all went to itself isn't it? yes <laughs> and our business just died overnight just and it's so weird because it's so weird because there are parallels now with what's happening then. People are talking about their business just dropping off a cliff, mm. but nobody knows why. And we know why now because we lived through it last time. Yes. And there's these, yeah, the, these premonitions of things coming. Yes. 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 So, so that was a big blow, really. And, Huge. Um, yeah, I lost oh, the money, it, Jim, right it was then massive. as well. It, yeah. took, it took till 2010, January 2010, for it to completely die. But my friends were in property investment, as you know, and they yes. by 2008, 2009, they were starting to feel the remnant, the rumblings of something coming. Well, so it happened you, to us. It happened to us. Especially as you were in the top end exactly. corporate luxury They market, weren't doing weren't any events anymore. They, the no. banks weren't doing any events anymore. They canceled. It was November 2008. And everything just was cancelled, cancelled, cancelled across the board. And nobody was drinking champagne at, um, at that time. And they definitely weren't doing champagne events for their clients. So, no. so everything dropped off a cliff, like overnight, just before Christmas 2008. Yeah. So we limped along for a while, wondering what to do. I think we cashed in our pensions at this point because we didn't have any money. Yeah. And um, and then in in two thousand and and then we were renting this house in in South Manchester. And in two, September two thousand and nine, the tumble dryer caught fire. Oh, and God. destroyed the house. Oh my God. Yes. No, we didn't lose anybody or anything of any value. But we'd lost the house. We we didn't have anywhere to live, and wow. we didn't have any money either. We didn't we no. didn't have a job. You know we were, no. and you that know, is my, tough. It was very tough. We ended up in a caravan. We lived in a caravan for four months from September wow. to to the end of the year. It was it was really tough. Over winter. Yeah, it, it was. Was terrible. it like on a, on one of those um holiday park kind no, of? No, it was one a, a friend uh, offered it to us. It oh, was, we've uh, that. I know. Incredible. It, it was awful. But the tenants had left the French house. So January 2010, we said, right, can't stay here. Let's go back to France. So you talking about, you know, I would take these internet marketing strategies and apply them to my real world, what I what we would call an offline business. Yeah. Right. So I went back, to, we went back to France in January 2010, and we were really, really bruised financially and emotionally as well. Yeah. So and did you, can, do you mind me asking, did you own the house in France outright? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Wow. No, not outright. No, no. Oh, no. okay. We had a mortgage on it, right? Which So now out... you, so now the tenants have gone, you've got to pay the mortgage. Yes. But at least but, you've got somewhere to live. Yes, it was like, you know, it was like going home, really. God, I can't even begin to imagine how awful that all must have been. Oh, it was. And I haven't told you the half of it, really. But it was absolutely terrible for all of us. And on so many levels. 
so we got back to France in January 2010 and we were just kind of trying to survive. And then we couldn't pay the gas bill because the tenants had left a year earlier. So it was it was empty for a year. Yeah. While we were kind of making it big in the UK or <laughs> trying to. Right. You were able to pay the mortgage from your own income in the UK. No, we didn't and... pay it. We didn't pay it. Unbeknown okay. to me, we hadn't paid it. Ah, oh, and so, gosh. Yes. And so the first thing that happened was the gas was cut off. So we were like boiling water to wash. It was terrible. And we didn't we couldn't have any guests because we didn't have any heating. God, you, you really went down and down and down, did. didn't you? We went time? right down. We went really to the bottom. And then the and then in March, answered a knock at the door to find the bailiffs there with the papers to take the house away. Oh, my God. And I, as you can probably imagine, I had a moment. And I, after I sort of picked myself up off the floor, um, I decided that there was no way, there was no way they were going to take the house. No way. We'd been through so much that this was not going to happen. So I said to the bailiffs, I said, what do I need to do? And they said, you need to contact, this is all in French, you need to contact the bank. They've been trying to contact you for a year. You haven't paid the mortgage and they've sent us in. So I said, what do I need to do? They said, contact the bank, write to the bank and, and put a proposal together. So I did. And I wrote out the whole nine yards, you know, what had gone down, everything that had happened. And... Um, I said, I can pay you this amount of money. And I worked it out that I needed to make 40 grand from that B&B in that year in order to settle with, you know, keep the bank happy, put food on the table and run my B&B because that's what I decided I was going to do. I needed to reopen the B&B. <clears throat> so miraculously, they agreed. And so then I got to work. And bearing in mind, I'd only ever made about 10 grand a year from this B&B before as a hobby. Yeah, out of the two I, rooms that you rented out. That's right. So yeah. we moved out of our bedrooms. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it was a big house. And there were lots of other rooms. But now I had yeah. four ensuite rooms. Nice. Five, yeah. So I, I set up a website. Mary and Ryan helped me massively. There's going to be so many people watching this yeah. who we're talking about here. What yeah. an incredible bunch of people. Marion did your website. That's amazing. Marion did my website. She was enormously helpful at that point. Um, and you know what, Nicola? I I thought about it for a while. And I just to begin with, I just started doing what I'd done before, which is putting a vacancy sign outside and, and printing off some brochures with publisher you know, Microsoft publisher. Yeah. And yeah. I'm putting I'm putting them around the local businesses. And then one day I was online, right, listening to somebody on uh doing a webinar because I was like wondering what the heck I could do to make 40 grand a year because I had no clue how yeah. to do this. And suddenly I realized that I knew how to do it. And I started Well, what an epiphany moment that was. Oh unbelievable unbelievable can, can, can we just talk about the physical sensation when an idea like that arrives i don't I know about you but it feels like a big fat clunk coming down was. from the universe it was and I, everything that i'd learned in the failed champagne discovery company i put into practice in my b, &B. wow and in the and I did I've actually got goosebumps. I really mm -hmm. have. It's amazing. To I think. know. I, I feel this in my body as well whenever I tell this story, but because it was so amazing how it happened. So to begin with, I didn't have one shopping cart. I didn't have any tech. So I was doing, but I knew about emailing. I knew about emailing. And, and so I, in the first year, I didn't make 40 grand. I made 51,000. Wow. I know. You it, beat your target in the first year. And that was phenomenal as oh, well. Oh, the feeling, Yvonne. The oh, feeling my that God. And do you know, you I'll rescued tell you, everything. I don't, I don't know how I can tell you this without crying. But honestly, the, the way that it happened, I had made 40 grand by October. And I thought, shit, you know, sorry. Well, no, you I, can swear as much as you like. This is an adult I can, podcast. I mean, it, it sounds like small fry now, but at the time it was just un unbelievable. So 
I'd made 40 grand by October and I thought, well, I wonder if I can make 50 grand, right? I'll just keep on doing the same thing. I work my tail off. Because it um, isn't, it, you know, it isn't easy running bed and breakfast. No, you it's have not to... an easy business, right? It's no, not an easy you, I mean, apart from attracting the, the people, you have to then change the beds, clean the bathrooms, you have to cook the breakfast, you have to wash up after the breakfast, you have to be there to let them in. Yes, but I did get a cleaner. Good I for you. Get, I did get a cleaner because I did. I knew I couldn't do that. I no. knew that my job was to bring the guests Marketing. in and give them a great Marketing. experience, right? So I needed to off. I needed to delegate the cleaning, Good for which you. I did. Well, I did. a lot of people wouldn't have done that, and they'd have, they'd have not only done badly at their marketing, but they'd have worn themselves into the ground. So good for you for immediately. Well, you must have read the E Myth by then. Yes, but I had <laughs> read the E Myth because I'd been in your world for a while, <laughs> and I'd read your book as well, The Money Gym, and I, of course I was in your Money Gym as well. And you've so been to the I, I had learned. I, yeah, I had <laughs> learned so much during that short time in the UK from about two thousand five to two thousand and ten. I had learned so much yeah. that I didn't know that I'd learned, right? And Until... you didn't know that not every, every other B&B owner in the world didn't know any of that stuff? No, they didn't. They didn't. And especially and they still not the don't. ones in your area. And they, <laughs> No, especially in my area. And they still don't, unbelievably. Yeah. They still don't understand the concept of an online infrastructure to support an offline business. Yeah. But I did. Yeah. And I, anyway, we... By the time I had, by the time we got to Christmas in that first year in 2010, I was just short of 50 grand, just short of it. And I closed, family came and I closed the BNB and I just thought, you know, I've given it my best shot. I'm happy. And then, gosh, on New Year's Eve, two, uh, I got a phone call and two couples wanted to stay for the night and have dinner. And it just tipped me over the 50 grand. It was unbelievable. Oh, my God. God I'm was, so thrilled for you. Gosh, it was, I just, it was unbelievable. And then, so I made the 51,000. I think it was 51,195. And I thought, right, next year I'm going to double it. And that's when I started automating my systems. So in that second year, I made 104,495 euros. Wow. Four rooms without Booking.com, without Airbnb, without any of those online platforms. I did it all on my own marketing. And I loved it. Loved it. It was so rewarding because I could see it paying off day by day, week by week, month by month, all of this knowledge from a previous failed business mm. into this, you know, who would, who does that? I mean, who does that? Automating email campaigns. And I, I basically created, it was my own work. I basically created three email campaigns, one for booked in guests, one for past guests, and one for future guests with, the, with my lead magnet for my b and and those three email campaigns won me Infusionsoft's Ultimate Marketer Award in 2013. Ultimate Marketer Award. I know. Wow. When I signed well, up, them, breakfast owner, they must have absolutely loved that. They couldn't believe it. They, no. they, they told me when I signed up with them in 2011 because I knew I needed to automate. Yeah, and Infusion, let's, for the benefit of the viewers, Infusionsoft was the more sophisticated, but also nearly impossible to learn version of what we'd been using before One Shopping Cart. And it enabled yes. all these automations based on what actions people took. Yes. Uh, hard. I mean, it, I had to pay someone to teach me, and I was really good at that stuff. It was impossible to learn. I did it. I did it. And, uh, you know, if people were coming for this thing they get this email sequence if they were coming for that thing they get a different email sequence if they were coming in the summer they get this one if they were coming in the winter Ooh, it nice. was phenomenal i segmented the arse off it <laughs> and, and so everybody everybody felt special it, and, it, and, can we just it's, again can we just stop because when I had the Acacia, when I bought the Acacia, I think it was 2003, writing my mm. memoirs was a challenge because I had to try and pin all down the years. But I'd, I'd 
I, as soon as people opted in, I, I found an old dog-eared guest book and I got someone locally to type it all up and we could import it and follow up and, you know, and, and we had, I had the newsletter, the diary of a seaside landlady that went out once a week. It was all about wealth creation largely, but it obviously then the Acacia had their own mailing list. And, um, and it makes, when people arrive, having read your emails yeah. for so long, they yeah. feel like they're coming to a family place, don't they? And right. yours and was, they... but they feel like they know you. Yes, they do. They did. And I, you know, I've tweaked it over the years and, you know, clients use use these three me three email campaigns and there's variations on them because everybody's different everybody's got a different business yeah but the, but the principles remain right you need to build a relationship with them before they arrive yeah otherwise they can't trust you and they're susceptible to cancelling right so so the more you can give them before they arrive the more the less likely they are to the let you less like because yes and also you upsell in that process as well because the more they buy in they more the more you offer them things to buy they're not just cancelling the room they're cancelling the whole experience that they've reserved right because so right. you were setting up other things for them to do when they oh, arrived yeah. in the area totally yeah. I, I was their guide i was their see i should have learned from you expert. i really should have done yeah you've got to <laughs> set yourself up as a specialist yeah right you've got to do that because it, the commodity market is saturated there's too much competition and it's all about price you've got to get out of that so mm. and, and that's another thing that we did in the second year in the first year we didn't do it but in the second year we we started to become the champagne experts for the region the english speaking so you don't have to speak french we'll take you to visit our friends we'll we'll show you to the, we'll introduce the places you to the you'd never find absolutely. otherwise you've yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah you've got it right the restaurants the champagne absolutely tasting. and then i yeah. did deals with the local restaurants if i send my guests to you will you give them a free glass of champagne yes of course you know all of this stuff and 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 the, the business that i spread around was phenomenal the the laundry man he said i was the busiest b&b in my area you know and so you're about, sending your laundry out now oh yeah sending the laundry <laughs> out now not doing it that anymore right let's yeah, yeah. be professional and then i yeah. got a second cleaner in the second year I had two girls they were with me for five years they were brilliant yeah my, my i had an italian cleaner who was with me for the whole time she said yeah Every every room was different in my place. Yeah. It was all yeah. themed, if you recall, and uh, uh, and yeah. each certain set of sheets had to go on. The, it was all E Myth, my my place as well. E Myth is such a great book for aspiring entrepreneurs. It really is. Yes, because it's the principles that count, right? Yeah, and the principles are the same for all businesses. You have to adapt them for your particular business, but the principles are solid, yeah. and that's what I teach people. You know, just the this is the principle. Don't do what I did. Put that into your business and make it work for you. And let's then you... talk about let's let's talk about because you're you're starting to move on to teaching other people yes. about it now. Yes. So how did that come? We're in the second year. You 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 gunned for the for the doubling the turnover and Infusionsoft have awarded you this award, which is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so then, what happened in year three? Well, then they came to film me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen the film. It's they great. They sent a film crew out, which was absolutely phenomenal. Well, this this kept going. I mean, I it, it just it was it was phenomenal the way that it worked because once I got it set up with all of my systems and processes, I worked less. Yes, there was less work to do. More time to be creative and think more, about new ideas. Exactly. And so I would yeah. go out and film, you know, I'm here um, and this is a new attraction that's opened up and this is a new bar that's opened up over here. Let's meet the owner. Wow. Right. Yeah. That kind of thing. And I would go into into our local town and, and, and do some sort of little tour of this is a festival. I'm at the, I'm at the music festival. Let's go take a look around and see who's playing. And and have you seen the light show on the cathedral? Let's have a look at the light show on the cathedral. You know, I did all of this. And it was because I didn't work. I didn't work as hard. <laughs> And, and, and you that, must have been a local celebrity as well. You know, you must have been going into those restaurants and they must have been slipping you a little starter and, and all that stuff. Because I know that's yeah. what happened to me in Greece. Yes. You start to become a local celebrity because you're bringing yes, because I'm business. bringing business in. Yeah. Because the hospitality business in any locale is the bringer of new money, right, mm. into, into the local economy. The money that couldn't come from any other, by any yeah. other means, right? And so you've got to take that 
position. You've got to assume that position as the as the bringer of new money and then spread it around yeah. or encourage your guests because they're going to come with their tourist dollars no matter what. So you need to have them spend those tourist dollars with you and the people you recommend. Mm -hmm. That's how that's how economies rise. And that's why I'm so against platforms because and, and I'm getting a bit off topic here. So the, the booking.coms and the Airbnbs, oh, and I the Expedia, saying, yeah. right? I, I, I don't I don't like them and I no. never use them. And I realize that they do have their place. Right. I'm not going to say that they they don't have their place because they do. But here's what they do. Right. They siphon money out of the local economy between 15 and 42 percent on every booking oh, that comes through their platform is siphoned out of that economy. Yeah. So and, and up to between five and a half and seven and a half billion pounds is is extracted from the UK economy every year by them. Wow. I know. It's shocking, isn't it? I didn't know how bad it was until 2020 when my little favourite village in Greece that I run the Facebook group for still, um, they basically, it, they didn't pay them for the whole quarter. No. They, they took the money for the bookings, yeah. but in 2020, they nobody in Stupa got paid for the bookings for that year and probably the next year as well. Yeah. Because it was just, they just didn't pay them. How How is any small business supposed to survive that? Well, there's two ways you can work with them, right? And most people work with them on that basis where they get the platform to take the money because they don't have yeah. a website. They don't have an online payment system. No one did in Greece, no. <laughs> and they don't have what, what we call a channel yeah. manager, right? Which yes. avoids double bookings no matter where the booking comes from. They don't have all of that. And so, so the platforms have to take, you know, they take all the money and then yeah. they keep it. And then, you know, 2020, hospitality businesses had to shut down because of the government restrictions. So, you know, naturally those platforms suffered as well. So some bright spark probably had an idea one day, well, if we just keep the money just for an extra day, we'll make this amount of interest on the money. And then it got to two days and then it got to three days and now it's up to six months and it's still going on. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So 2020 really changed the way that those platforms interact with their businesses. Yeah as well yeah but come on back to yours yeah. i mean we could we could don't don't let's get us started on the well, last four years and hospitality no. we'll that be here all me. day but so tell me are you year three year four where are we up to now in your story um well we're up to so i think we're up to year five now six year, year six in 2016 um i won a contract with usaid to create and because i was so internet famous at this point right, right. <laughs> I, I wanna I was spotted by USAID um and they wanted somebody they wanted a consultant and at this point I was sort of helping people I was helping people a little bit informally and casually and I think I'd set up my Better Breakfast Coach officially. Yeah, I was going to say, I definitely remember you having yeah. that. I had I had set up Better Breakfast Coach at that point, but I was still running my b, &B and still enjoying it. But in 2016, it all changed for me because USAID, USAID spotted me on LinkedIn and invited me to apply to for a contract to create and deliver five hospitality trainings in Kyrgyzstan. In in Kurdistan. Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Where's that? Yeah. Right. That's what I said. <laughs> I've got no idea where that is. Well, it's a beautiful country in Central Asia. It's it, if you look eastwards, I don't know where we are here, but it, it, if you look eastwards past Europe, past Iraq, past Turkey, then you'll come to the last sort of air vestiges of the Soviet Union, like Kazakhstan, yeah. Tajikistan. Afghanistan. What, what they call the stands. The stands. Or well, Kyrgyzstan <laughs> is one of those. And it, it borders China. It's that far east. Wow. Yeah. So I won it, right? I won that contract. And I traveled there three times in 2016 and delivered those trainings, created them and delivered those trainings. It was a phenomenal well, face to face experience. trainings in, yes. in rooms. Yes. Wow. In Russian. <laughs> no. Yes. How did so, you do that? Well, I don't speak Russian. So no, I was obviously. like speaking through the microphone, 
yeah. and they had two translators at the back of the room and so they were translating it into Russian as I was speaking and they were hearing it in their earphones in Russian. It and was, what was the delay on that? Was what? Well the jokes pretty much fell flat you know. <laughs> Well, they would have felt fallen flat with the sense of humour, I would have thought, but <laughs> just not because your sense of humour is not there, but because they, people have different senses of humour around the world. But then having a delay as well, that must have been so hard. It was. It was wild. It was completely wild. But were they paying you vast amounts of money? Vast. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. yeah. And what, I'm, I'm still confused about why an American company, or were they not American? No, we're, we're well, they are American, training. yeah. USA idea are, are American. So they were pumping money into the Kyrgyz economy um, in, in exchange for, I don't know, mining rights or something. I don't oh, know. Oh, right, okay. Here yeah, we that go. kind of thing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <okay. laughs> and, 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 and you went out to this incredibly... Did, what, what was the hotel? I'm oh, sorry, I'm totally blown by this. What was the hotels like? And, and what, did they take you out nice. for dinner and stuff? Yeah. Yes, all of that. Remarkably nice. Oh my I love so much about it. It's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful. Is it? Oh, what we've never heard beautiful. of, but it's beautiful. Right, wow. right, right, right. But, you know, it, it it was a really, really lovely experience. They were so lovely. The people were so lovely. And I'm still in touch with them today. Oh, some my of them. God. Mm. But so did I, that did that help your online business? I mean, were you actually mentoring anybody by then? Did you have a book? What what was how what did the bed and breakfast coach look like at that stage? And what did that experience do to change it? I I had a book at this point. I had written my first book. I did um I think it was in 2016 or maybe 15, I'd written a book on what I'd learned because I I could see. Because I was in at that time, I was in various LinkedIn forums, LinkedIn okay. groups, and people were asking me for help, and and I was giving them help for free, yeah, yeah. saying do Great this, and, you know, yeah, do it, this, yeah. and they were saying, oh my god, it worked, it worked. What else have you got? Oh, so wonderful. then I turned it into a little course. I think I sold it for ninety seven bucks. It was just simple stuff, right, about the principles of an online infrastructure for an offline business. And have I got? Uh, have I got? literally just before i came on the call today have i got a thing for you right. a lead gen thing for you right. from your book okay okay you've great. worked with me a bit on my AI, ai bots haven't you i have yes oh I well have. you're yes. gonna love this then okay i'm all ears i'm all ears <laughs> um let, let's do it anyway um yeah so i had started bed and breakfast coach and then i i saw online there was a lady called alicia dunham's in the us and she had this online program called bestseller in a weekend and i wrote my book in a weekend yeah and it, it, it was, can, can be done yeah it especially well, now yes well especially now we didn't have ai but what we did is we spoke the book you 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 talk it right you have okay she showed your us bullet how to, points to, yeah to lay it out in the bullet points this goes this and this goes there and that goes here my coffee's gone just, completely cold by the way oh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> no i'm so i'm so engrossed don't i can't believe it Oh no, it is phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. And um, so you so you bullet pointed it, and then you spoke it, and then and then got someone to tr transcribe it, or was that's there... right? That's yeah. right. And it was all done and dusted. Well, the book was done in the weekend, and then it went off for editing, and um, to her people, and then uh, it became a bestseller on Amazon at the time. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, and I've written two more books since then, and they're really just like updated versions of the first book okay, okay as i've learned and 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 you say you have to say things in different ways you know yeah. to, to have so i've got three books now my last book i wrote last year and it's only in pdf form at the moment so it's a lead gen i think so you've got to write a memoir yes i have actually i have, you have got to there's write so a much memoir. more nicola yeah. that we would be here all day with this but um i have so much to say about so many things <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like created, you right like yeah you. Yeah. yeah well you, you know I was I was just obsessed with the idea you know after I lost Steve mm -hmm. I was obsessed with the idea that I would just die and and my children wouldn't have or my grandchildren wouldn't have any idea of anything you know no. that I'd learned it was yeah. more about what I'd learned trying to pass that on yeah and um and so I, I went on this course about how to write a memoir and it's you you basically structure your your life around the hero's journey five yes. act structure yeah and it just makes writing a book a memoir particularly so effortless yeah 
and in each each scene as well it goes you know there's certain it's, it's just like internet marketing there's certain not tricks because they're not trying to fool anyone but structures it's a structure. supportive yeah. structures for your yeah. creativity yeah and that's one of the things i've found about ai as well if you use it right it's a supportive structure for yes. your creativity yeah but it makes you so much more creative and so yes. much more productive a bit like you found in infusionsoft made yes. you yes. in your business it's a vehicle it's a vehicle yeah. for your creativity it's not about the technology right it doesn't matter no. whether you use another crm system but it, yeah. it's the principle that the technology is is your vehicle and that's what ai is now yeah. right it's a vehicle yeah. to draw out more creativity from you i had such a lot of fun with infusion well i was just about to say the word fun it's oh, so much fun so much fun i mean people would rock up at my doorstep and say oh yvonne i feel like i already know you i know because you know? i communicated I with them so well beforehand and they'd already booked a champagne tour they'd already ordered dinner you know they'd already already done this and, and booked that you know and it was it was just it was so effortless really yeah so going back to so you, you, I'm in you Kyrgyzstan. Building your own business we haven't even got to that bit yet <laughs> which bit which bit do you want to talk well, about the, now? well the um the, so so yeah t- tell me how being in Kyrgyzstan affected the bed and breakfast coach and and I knew I wanted to do that. I knew I wanted to do that. And I've since learned, I mean, I'm always learning like you. I'm always learning. And in the last year, I've come across this thing called human design. Oh, interesting. I'm going to be interviewing Nicola Burge shortly. Oh, phenomenal. Phenomenal. She's doing a lovely job with that. I will listen to that. It's phenomenal. And now I know why I needed to move on from the bed and breakfast into teaching. Yes, yeah. into teaching, yeah. So you've now got the bed and breakfast coach as a mm. business. So mm. was what did Kyrgyzstan bring to you? Was it confidence that you could work on an international stage with? Because I know you work with hospitality owners all over the world, don't you? I do, and I'd already presented um, in the US. I'd already spoken on stages in the US um, before I went to Kyrgyzstan, and yeah. I'd already published a book before I went to Kyrgyzstan, but it just gave me, I created the whole, I created all of the trainings, which I really enjoyed doing. And I really enjoy sharing knowledge. I really, and and I enjoy teaching. I enjoy mentoring and I enjoy coaching. And I knew that I needed to do more of that and less of the B&B. I think I'd come to the end of it in, after seven years, I'd sort of come to the end of what I could do with it. Well, it's a bit, you're either going to buy another one exactly. and another one and another one and build exactly. a massive business or you're going to stop. There's there's no two, two well, middle ground, be- really. Because, and that, that's a really good point because I could have bought another B&B, right? But because of my profile, which I didn't know at the time, I'm a natural guide for others, right? I'm a natural guide for others. So the more I can guide, the more I can impact, right? And the more I can make a difference. Whereas I think I'd done everything that I could do with that B&B. And so other people who weren't natural guides, who were some other profile, they would have gone and bought another one and replicated the whole system and, and it would have, beca- would have become a big empire. Mm-hmm. I'm not into that. That's not my thing. I'm, I'm a guide. I'm a natural guide. So I need to do things that play to my strengths. And so, and that's why I really went and fill for, you with joy as well. You need to, do, I think entrepreneurs need joy. to find the things that fill you with yes. joy. Yes, definitely. Definitely. So I just, I, I went full out on, on bed and breakfast coach. For the benefit of people listening who are thinking my business is doing all right, but I'd like to build it more. What did you start? What did you do from the beginning? No, not the beginning. Cause you obviously had some sort of systems ticking over. Yes. What, I what did you do to I, build it? Well, I took my eye off. I took my eye off my bed and breakfast and focused on bed and breakfast coach, and I uh, decided that that was going to be my thing now. And then I just gradually, um, I just I gradually closed it really. And and di- what did you do with bed and breakfast coach to? Because you know, I'm, one of the people don't realize that lead gen is the 
the biggest thing. Having a business yeah. is all very well. And really, yeah. I've had so many businesses over the years. But I'm, you know, and I'm a, I'm a natural born marketer salesperson. I love telling people about things. I love sharing things and all that stuff. But unless you're bringing leads into the business on a consistent basis, your business is going to falter at some point. Yes. So what, what were you doing at that point to bring leads into the bed and breakfast? Camp? That's a great question. And I think also it depends on your profile not just your human yeah. design but knowing who you are right knowing how how you operate best mm. i'm really good with systems i like tech and i'm good with systems so if i can systemize something then i will but at that point but i'm also really good at making videos you know i like making videos i've got a whole setup here uh, rudimentary but you know I can easily get on camera and tell you something about you know how you do this or how you do that I make videos you know teaching videos all the time for my clients and do you have a YouTube channel oh definitely I started my YouTube channel in 2010 for my B&B &B, wow and I posted my first video in June 2010 as part of my of, of, of realizing that I already knew what to do right I already knew that I needed to showcase my area uh -huh. and that is and, way... and does youtube bring you leads yes so i've got about five and a half thousand subscribers now wow. um and yes youtube brings me leads facebook brings me leads mostly linkedin brings me leads as well okay do you have a facebook group yes i have two facebook groups one is for advertising your your rooms one is an advertising group okay and then i have another group which is about discussion and learning okay so you must I send me actually, links to everything that you want yeah. to me to put in the video description. Yeah. Underneath. I also have a podcast. I have um, I'm on Spotify, Spotify. <laughs> I'm on YouTube podcasting now because you told me how to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Thank you. you know, it's always <laughs> moving, great. isn't it? But the principles yeah. are the same. You've got to get leads. As you say, you've got to get people. You've got to become well known in some way, in a way that works for you, in a way yes. that plays to your strengths. Right. Yeah. And and it's interesting about video because I was just talking to to my friend Andy about this because he's a massive introvert, you know. He'll put on events and he's always the one in the corner right. dispensing little bits of wisdom. But he's not an extrovert, and I'm not. An, and I've I've discovered I'm a confident introvert. And I don't know what what would you call yourself? Would a you confident call yourself? introvert. A confident right. introvert. Yeah. So getting back to human video design, is perfect for that. It is actually. It is. Mm. I mean, I I could. I could not do anything like cold calling. I could no, never do God, that. No, God, no. I can't even ring but up some, members of my family. No, but some people can, right? Some yeah, people no, can do, do that, but I would never, I, I would never do that. And that, again, that's about knowing who you are and how you yeah. operate so that you are always having fun. Really. There's always another way. You know, yeah, you don't have is. to do it. You don't no. have to do business and entrepreneurship as the people that, that you see. But what I don't know about you, but I see people and other people doing things in other other arenas, and I think, oh damn, that would work for me. Right. And so I'm always picking up ways of doing I new ways too. of doing things. That's yeah. exactly what I do. I mean, that's exactly what I did with my B and B. Everything I learned about building my B and B to hundred thousand euros a year with just four rooms and no platforms came from outside of the industry. Right. And Jay Abraham says that in one of his books, true innovation comes from outside the industry that you're in. Was that his book, How to Get Everything You Want Out of What You've Already Got or something I think like it, that? I think it was, yeah. Oh, I love that book. Yeah, I think it's here somewhere. But yeah, yeah. You, you've always got to be looking outside because otherwise you're in an echo chamber. Yeah. yeah. And nobody teaches what I teach at Bed and Breakfast Coach and, and you know, the emailing systems, what I call the engine of the business with your database. Yeah. I've never seen anybody teach that in hospitality. Never. Wow. In all the 10 years that I've been helping people, it's still not. And just, just recently this year, people are starting to talk about emailing. Just this wow, year. really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Talk about being ahead of your time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God. So where are you now? What are you doing now? What What's we've heard your lowest we i felt your lowest moment there i really I did, did too and, i did uh, too <laughs> yeah i could see um what's been what's been well the highlight must have been those people booking in on new year's eve but <sighs> you, and going to cut i can't even kazakhstan 
Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. I'm so sorry to any viewers who are from Kyrgyzstan. We'll get it in the by the end of the call. Well, it's so um, funny because because when I got back from Kyrgyzstan, one of my first clients when I was really going for better was coach came from Kyrgyzstan. Oh, and, and she wasn't one of the people who were on on my trainings. It was just out of the blue. She was English. Right. She was living in the UK. And she said, uh, she said, I'm from Kyrgyzstan originally. I'm like, what? Oh, I've been there. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I mean, what so, are the chances? So what what are your what would you like to do with the business next? What 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 would you I mean, would you love to do more trainings like that? Would you like to just build the business bigger and work with bigger groups of B and B owners? What's in your future? So um just gonna put this out there, right? So in, in 2015, I made a tv pilot program and it was called bed and breakfast rescue i watched it it's fantastic <laughs> i know i want to do more of that and, and I, it, I i'm putting it out there and i want to i want to have my own tv program helping owners and, and you've also, got to produce it yes you've got it, to be you've got yes. to you've got to be the production company yes and you've well, got I, to film a pilot another pilot and you've got to get someone to sell it into the into somewhere like Netflix for you. Yes, I, I'm aware of that. I, I attended a workshop last weekend on this very thing. Did you really? I did, yes. And then I yesterday I, I got in touch with my production team who did the pilot program, you know, nine years ago. And, okay. Um, so, yeah, I want to do that. I also trained this year. I trained to be a therapist um because i think business owners need therapy <laughs> well they do and, and i needed I it know... for myself i needed it for myself first you need someone to talk to you, you do. really do and you a business do. coach can fulfill that role but it's better almost if you've got someone who's trained as a therapist as well i only know two business therapists there's one in america who's really huge and charges an absolute fortune and i watering amount of money um, he's billed as the business psychiatrist and then there was one lady here in the UK who was a business oh, oh Paula Gardner oh right Paula Gardner who yeah. ran do your own PR yeah she's trained as a psychiatrist or yes. psych uh, yeah something psychologist quite, or yeah something no it's something quite academic it's tough it's really mentally it, tough it is very very tough and it brings up I think business is like a personal de development journey it, it brings up all of your stuff from the past that you think you've forgotten about and you think yeah. doesn't matter anymore because it was so long ago, but actually it holds you back. It really does. And if yeah. you don't, if you don't deal with it, you, you won't be able to make any headway. In, you in keep business. making the same mistakes over and over again. The same yeah. thing keeps happening and happening again and again. So you, you've got to clean up your childhood really, because that's where it comes from. So oh, I did tell it. me about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too, me too. We could me and my abandonment day. issues. Yeah, absolutely, all of it, right? Um, and I did it for myself because, um, you know, what happened to me and, and what had happened in the last few years as well is just as another story. But, yeah. but, but I find that I'm actually quite good at it. I'm quite good at, at giving therapy. And, and I'm combining it now with my um, bed and breakfast coach training for yeah. hospitality owners. At the very least, the therapy training will give you greater skills to work with your B&B &B yes. owners. Yes. And, and at the very, you know, just such a, I've never, ever wanted to go down the psychological side of things because I'm so damaged myself. <laughs> <laughs> I stick purely to the practical marketing and tech, <laughs> but, um, yeah. but I totally get it. I totally yeah. get it. Yeah, it it is it is useful. I had some really great testimonials from clients, which is which is really really nice. wonderful. So you've got to keep growing, haven't you? You've got to keep adding to your skill set. Um, nothing ever stays the same; it's always moving. And and although the principles are timeless, you know mm. they things move, things move, yeah. and and so I'm I'm really happy about being. You I mean therapist. you could take, I mean it could you you could have an annual event. You could, you know, uh, but the one thing people like you and I have got to realise is we don't have to do everything ourselves. Right, right. Because we're very tempted to, I don't know about you, but I'm very tempted to learn everything ourselves, do everything ourselves, don't want to rely on anyone else because we've been through such tough times when we yeah, felt let down. Yeah, trust issues as well, yeah, trust yeah, issues. Yeah. 
So the other thing that I, I started to do before COVID and then had to abandon it was run retreats. And I really enjoy running retreats, small, intimate retreats with maybe five or six people. Mm. Um, on, in on, a fabulous location, obviously. In a <laughs> fabulous location like Champagne. I had one all ready to go uh, that was all booked up in 2020, but we had we had to uh, abandon Don't, that. Yeah, let, We're, yeah. we're going to just have to not talk about Ed, what's happened since then because it makes me so mad. Yes, and me. All those people, yes. completely devastated. Yes. Especially in hospitality. I look around at the restaurants and the, and the, there aren't many hotels, well, there aren't many hotels in Shoreham, but the restaurants and bars in my area are still feeling the pain. They really are. And it's just this budget, everything. it's just... It, yeah, it changed everything COVID did psychologically. It changed everything. Yeah. And, and, and um, But there are ways, you know, I'm, I'm discovering ways to help people protect themselves going forward and bed and breakfast owners it's a bit like farmers you know they need to know how to protect their assets they going do forwards. they yeah. do they do and i mean it, it when when it all kicked off in march 2020 you know we had a cohort of clients and we kept them going right because we wow. applied we, we applied even though guests couldn't visit you know we were into selling stuff online you know because because the guests wanted to support their hosts okay right? even though they could because really... they built such a great relationship yeah, that's right with them. that's yeah. right and so and so we had to find ways of you know what else can we offer that's going to allow them to give you money right and keep you going and it worked like a charm it really did and then when and we I... opened up again when when the whole um thing opened up again in the summer they were just going crazy absolutely crazy because they kept that relationship going and mm. stayed close and gave the, the 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 guests the past guests opportunities to buy from them and therefore support them so that they'd be there again when it all when it all opened well, up again well. so you know you've got to think a bit strategically you know this is how you know we all say don't we with it, every adversity there's opportunity resilience and mindset otherwise you could just crumble absolutely you could Looking back over your amazing career, amazing things I didn't even know myself about what you've done there and and looking forward to your future. What one or two tips would you give an aspiring or a new ish entrepreneur? What would you say has been made the difference for you? Clean up your shit, basically, from your childhood. <laughs> right. Know that you're going to have to work on it at some point. Just yeah. know that. Right. Even if you don't see it right now even if things are going swimmingly right now for you, just know that whatever happened in your childhood, whether it was, you know, things happen to us all the time. It's the human And also experience. our attitudes to money. Yes. I mean, the money gym taught me that is everybody's got these attitudes to money that they bring from their childhood. I mean, exactly. if you stop, just stop and think about the words wealth and money, yeah. you'll hear someone's voice in your head saying something. That's great. And that's the, yeah, the voices yeah. will be running you somehow. Yeah. 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 So what, you know, we, we can't escape childhood trauma, really, whether no. it's, whether it's big trauma or little trauma, we all have it. And, yeah. and, and, to, and it's just a question of the degree and, but on your entrepreneurial journey, at some point you will be faced with it. You, you will. So just know that. Um, also every, every adversity carries the seed of an opportunity and learning to see that and learning you know okay so something bad has happened something bad has happened um and so you know looking for the opportunity within that adversity because there always is mm. and, and the third thing i would say is is surround yourself with people who get you i think that is the most important thing and the I mean, in, when I think back to the mid 2000s and we were all, you know, in the entrepreneurial soup of it all, weren't we? With the yeah. online world emerging and all of that stuff that came out of it. We were all riding the that internet way. marketing conferences and Absolutely. the wealth conferences. You've and, got to go to property those conferences. You've got to yeah. be with people. You've got to be yeah. with people who think like you do, because yeah. most of the population do not. Yeah, we're in they a real minority, not. aren't we? We are in a minority. Most of the population will you know and no disrespect to anybody at all but we are no. taught to get a job 
And I, I, I go back to Robert Kiyosaki's work, which you introduced me to at the Money Gym. Yeah, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. You... And, and the rich, the, the, the most boring sounding book is Rich Dad's Guide to Investment. But mm. it's the, the last third of it is about investing your time and money in your own business. And it's yeah. golden, the information yeah. in that. Yeah. So when I think about the cash flow quadrant, you know, most of us are taught to be on the left, right? Yeah. On the left hand side. Employee, employee freelance and, and then freelance self-employed Mo yeah. we're taught to be that at school it's drummed into us you've got to get a job you know you, what what would you like to do with your life I want to be an accountant I want to be a lawyer I want to be a doctor which is all great we need that as well right but if you want to become an entrepreneur or you feel like you could become an entrepreneur or you have an idea you've got to cross what I call the great divide Mm. onto the right hand side from of the left quadrant. hand side to right hand you've side got, yeah. you've got to cross that and that will bring up all sorts of beliefs all sorts of of um childhood crap basically yeah yeah, yeah and well. that is the journey that that but is they the can be worked through journey. they can be you know re yeah. reading Dad, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then reading e-myth revisited um and there's there's several i mean i've got a top 30 books that i recommend that have made a difference in my life knocking around on LinkedIn. I think it's on my website as well. So that, you know, they're just amazing. There's some amazing books out there. And then occasionally you'll run into an entrepreneur and, like I did several times and you'll say, have you read blah? And have you read, and they go, no. And then you think, well, A, you've got a real treat in store. And B, you're amazed that these people have got this innate sense of what to do. Yes. But you, you know, you've, you've experienced it yourself. Sometimes mm. it just feels like it comes through you. It does. It, it does. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm going to be 70 next week. <gasps> no. I am. I You're am. the most glamorous Gen Xer I know, I think. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> are you a boomer or are you Gen X? I'm a boomer. I'm a oh, boomer. Oh, well, you, well you're definitely in... the most glamorous boomer I know. 1954. So, yeah, so I'm stepping into my seventh decade from next wow, Wednesday. That's so exciting. It is. And um, and so inspirational for yeah. anyone watching this as well. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, never you're as on old, fire right? as you ever were. You absolutely really are. am. Absolutely am. And I'm even more excited about the future, stepping into my seventh decade in style. And you know, yeah, yeah, who knows? Awesome. Well, I've got something big to tell you after this about right. what you can do with those books, and you're going to yes. love it. Yes. Um, Yvonne Halling, wow, what a time, what a ride, what, a, what an amazing hour and a half we've had together. It's just been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me, Nicola. And I'm going to put all your links underneath. So if anyone's watching this, they want to get in touch with Yvonne or they want to just reach out and tell us, you know, like, subscribe, tell her how much you appreciate her story. Um, and thank you very much. And, and we'll talk very soon. Thanks, Nicola.